Before we start with our reading, I think we ought to ask the Lord to bless the rest of this service. Lord, come to you this morning. God, I pray that your name would be lifted up and glorified in all that is said and all that is done. I thank you that it already has been. Your name has been glorified. Your name has been lifted up. Thank you for the time of worship that we've enjoyed this morning. Thank you for the time of Sunday school that we've had of learning and growing. God, now as we come before your word and break forth the word of truth, I pray, dear Lord, that you would feed our hearts, our souls. God, that you would minister to each and every need in here. I don't know specifics about what everybody's facing or dealing with, but God, you do. And I pray that you would minister to them as they need to be ministered to. I pray that you would take and guide this sermon, this service, and Lord, that you would move in a very special way. God, if we, if we preach and we listen, and we only do it out of duty, and we only do it because we're here, because we have to, God, it's, though your word never returns void, Lord, everything else would be in vain if you're not involved. So we need you today. We need you to move. We love you, we praise you, we thank you for what you're going to do. It's in Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mark chapter number 4. Start reading at verse number 35, if you would, with me. Mark chapter number 4, verse number 35. It says, In the same day, when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Amen. Now take your Bibles over to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 8. Matthew chapter number 8. Matthew chapter number 8. And I'll start reading at verse number 23. Matthew chapter 8, start reading at verse number 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? One more passage in the book of Luke, chapter number 8. Luke chapter number 8, verse number 22 through 25 reads this. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. Verse 23, Luke chapter 8. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake. And they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth 
even the winds and water, and they obey him. The same event told but by three separate people, three different points of views, the same outcome. I want to talk to you this morning on the idea and the topic of the back of the boat. The back of the boat. We take a look and in this passage or these passages we find the, the account given by the writers of the Gospels here. And they are going into this sea. They're crossing from one side to the other. And in the middle of the sea there comes this great storm and the wind and, and the waves begin to pile high into the ship. And the ship is being tossed back and forth. And the disciples go run to Jesus, and Jesus is in the hinder part of the ship, according to our text in Mark chapter 4, and he is asleep there in the hinder part of the ship. And he wakes up, or they awake him, and he cries to the storm, and the storm listens to Jesus. Now I want to point out just a few things as we take a look at an overview of this whole scenario that's taking place. Number one, I want you to understand... That it was Jesus' idea to cross the lake. Every account that we read, Jesus said, He either said, let us go to the other side, or you find that His disciples followed Him into the ship. So Jesus was the one who was leading. He was the one who was guiding His disciples. He says, we're going to go from here, and we're going to the other side. Now you say, what does that have to do with anything? Well, let me tell you this. When Jesus says you're going to make it somewhere, you're going to make it no matter Amen. what happens in between. Right. When He says you're going from here to here, no matter what storms you face in between, you will make it. Because Jesus, if you are a Christian, Jesus is in your boat. I think of the little song, With Christ in my vessel I can smile at the storm, smile at the storm, smile at the storm. With Christ in my vessel I can smile at the storm as we go sailing home, sailing, woo, sailing home, sailing, woo, sailing home. With Christ in my vessel I can smile at the storm as we go sailing home. How can you smile at a storm? Because Christ is in the vessel. He says, if you, if he says we're going from this point to this point, you can thank God. By the way, you have to realize Jesus understood. He was not surprised when the storm arose. Amen. So when Jesus tells his disciples, we're going to get in the boat and we're going across the lake, Jesus was fully aware of the storm they were about to get into. Jesus knew the situations. By the way, whatever situation you're in now, whatever storm you're facing in life now, whatever doubts and fears that you are having to deal with now, Jesus knew about them before God. Whatever surprises you have encountered the past week, the past day, the past month, the past year, was no surprise to Jesus. He didn't wake up and go, oh, there's a storm? Wow, I didn't know that. He was aware before he set sail of what would take place in between. Matter of fact, not only was he aware of the storm that they were going to go into, but he was even aware of how the disciples would react to the storm. He knew that there was going to be a lesson in the middle of that storm for his disciples. People say, well, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, a couple reasons. I can't give any specifics. Let me give real specifics as to exactly why. Number one, though we live in a sin-cursed world. Yeah. Okay? We are, things that take place happen as a result of sin, the sin nature. Right. And as you study God's Word, when somebody does something wrong, it affects other people. Right. You say, yeah, but I didn't have this, well, why, why does somebody wake up and they have cancer? Why does somebody uh, have a car wreck? Why does somebody have this and it's out of their control? Because it's a sin-cursed world. Right. Diseases, death, came as a result of sin. Yes. Right. Well, I just 
don't think I deserve. I'm, I'm a good enough person. I shouldn't have to go through this. So who is not good enough that they should go through whatever you're feel, feeling? Right. See, whenever people say, well, I, I'm a good person. I shouldn't have to, or they're a good person. They shouldn't have to go through that. So you, so they're too good for this problem. So who then is good, who's bad enough to have this problem? See, when you say they're, they're a good person, they shouldn't have to go through that. You tell me who deserves them to go through whatever it is. Who deserves the loss of a child? Who deserves to have to face cancer? Who deserves to have to go through a tornado, a hurricane, an earthquake? Who deserves that? You say, well, then why do they have to go through it? Number one, it's a sin-cursed world we live in. Number two, if they're a Christian, there may simply be a lesson Amen. for us to learn. Amen. There may be something that we need to learn in the storm. His disciples had a lesson to learn. Jesus was not surprised at the reaction of his disciples. He knew their doubt and he knew their fear. You say, but if I follow Jesus, he might get me out of my comfort zone. Matter of fact, when you read the Bible, you find out nine times out of ten, that's exactly where he takes you. That's right. But just remember this, out of your comfort zone is right in his comfort zone. Where you feel uncomfortable, you begin to rely on Him. Yes, and He's comfortable with that. Amen. He knew how His disciples would react. Watch this though. He was also aware of the solution to the storm. Not only did He know the storm would happen, not only did He know the reaction of His disciples, but He already knew the solution to the storm. See, we have to realize that when we pray to God, it's not so that we can inform God of what's taking place. It is so that we can humble ourselves before God and say, Lord, I need your help. I know the solution. I don't know the solution, but Lord, I know you know the solution. Jesus says, I know the solution already. Not only was Jesus idea, I want to take a quick look at the storm. The storm itself. When you take a look at these passages we've read together, you find that the storm was a very fierce storm. One of them talked about the wind and the sea beating against the way or against the boat. One of them talked about them actually coming into the boat. And one of them talked about being the boat being filled with water. Now, I'm not a big sailor, okay? I'm not a big person who, who does a lot of sailing. I've not had a lot of experience in it. But this thing I know, when water gets in the boat, you're in trouble. <laughs> I know that much. When the boat becomes full of water, <laughs> you're in trouble. Right. So you want to try to keep the boat dry on the inside. It's okay for the water to be outside the boat. But when it starts getting inside, you're in trouble. And we find in this passage that the, the waves are crashing into the boat. This is not just some little storm and just a couple little bumpy waves. This is a fierce storm that's taking place. By the way, for these disciples to be panicked the way they were shows you the severity of the storm. You say, how is that? Because, first of all, the storm was out of the disciples' control. But several of the disciples themselves were experienced fishermen. This was not the disciples' first time in a storm. So whenever they're experienced fishermen and they're in a storm that they're afraid of, I'd be cowering and hiding away from someone from something like that. It would scare me to death. If they were that afraid they'd experience what to do in storms. But it was still out of their control. No matter what they did, no matter what their experience was, it wasn't good enough. Amen. It was out of their control. It wasn't their first storm they ever had to face with. Matter of fact, they tried everything they knew what to do before they finally went to Jesus. They didn't, as, they didn't go to Jesus as soon as the storm started. And here's why I believe that. I believe that because the Bible says the boat was full of water. When the storm first started, the boat didn't start off with a bunch of water in it. So they were trying to do what they knew to do. They tried everything that they had in their own power, in their own strength, in their own might to solve the solution, to solve the problem they did not have in their own abilities. 
Uh, even with all their abilities, they were unable to save themselves. It doesn't matter what abilities a person has. It doesn't matter what good deeds a person does. They cannot save themselves right. out of life. Right. Right. It doesn't matter how good a person is. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter how many times they've been dunked. How many times they've been sprinkled. How many times they've been spit on by the preacher. It doesn't matter. Nothing in and of yourselves or some action you do will save you. Amen. All right. Amen. It's out of your control. Yeah. The disciples experienced, yeah, but I had a lot of experience in this. The disciples had a lot of experience in this storm and they were still shaking. Amen. But understand this, the storm was never out of Jesus' control. Right. See, while the storm was out of the disciples' control and they couldn't deal with it, they couldn't handle it, and they were panicked and they were worried, Jesus didn't have to worry about it. It was never out of Jesus' control. Not one time. Now the boat itself. I've been looking and did a little bit of research on the boat. Found this interesting. The boat, they actually, back in 1986, around there, they dug up uh, found a, a replica of a boat that was actually buried in the lake uh, there in the Middle East that was the same uh, type of fishing boat which Jesus would have sailed in and would be a part of during this story, during this account. They found that they, the, the length of this is actually uh, over in a museum. I want to say it's over in the Middle East somewhere. I'm not for sure the name of the museum right now. But uh, anyway, the length of it was it is 27 feet long. Seven and a half feet wide, and it was at its height, as far as being deep, it was about 4.3 feet uh, high. Now, this is interesting, as I stated it, and I actually saw the, watching the video, and I saw them scroll down through all the pieces of wood. It's not like some people, you, you build one out of one piece of wood. They were very poor people, so they had to build out several different types of wood. Now, I find this interesting. You know how many pieces of lumber they had to use? How many different types of lumber they had to use? Twelve. You say, why is that interesting? Well, I just, you know, twelve tribes of Israel, twelve type, tri types of, of, of lumber. It's just, to me, that's an interesting fact. Now, here's something even more interesting. Of the twelve types of lumber that was used, two of them, one of them, one of them is called the Judas tree. Now, isn't that interesting? The other one is called Christ Thorn. That's the name of the one that they used. Now, isn't that interesting? Not to mention they had the sycamore tree on that boat. It seemed like Jesus had an experience with the sycamore tree. Amen. And a man named Zacchaeus. Amen. He had a dealing with Christ Thorn. The thorns were placed on his brow himself. I mean, he had dealing with Judas. But I want to focus on the people in the boat for just a moment. The people in the boat. You have the disciples. The boats uh, of those days, they'd hold about, at the max, about 15 people. All right, so you have Jesus and his disciples. You have 13 people in the boat. And that is plenty of room. All right? They could have squeezed in maybe one or two more people. You find in our passage, uh, actually one of the accounts says there are other little ships with them. But by the way, I heard one preacher say that that was a blessing to him because it helps him to know when he goes through the storm, he's not the only one Amen. that's having to face it to him. That's right. That's right. There's other little ships in the storm with them. Good. Notice the people of the boat. The disciples were in the front of the boat. You say, how do you know that? Because Jesus was in the hinder part of the boat. And the way the boats are made as they're shaped in the back part of the boat, <laughs> you have uh, at the back, there's two paddles. And they're the controlling paddles. They're the ones that control, like the rudder. That's where Jesus was. I'm going to get that in a second. Okay? <clears throat> he was back there. And they had a little box. It was like a little platform type thing where they put underneath it. They put all the ropes, right? all the stuff they used, all of their controlling equipment. And that's what Jesus was sleeping on top of. He was in the hinder part of the boat. The disciples were in the front. 
And the storm was being raging to them. They were being tossed up and down, high. And they were, they were being greatly tossed by the storm. And they were in themselves panicked. Sometimes we let Jesus get in front of the boat and let him say, peace, be still. We face a problem. The first thing we begin to do is begin to panic. We begin to worry. We begin to fret. You don't have to take on the front of the storm. Let Jesus be there. The Bible says, thou art my refuge. Let Jesus be your refuge. Jesus was in the hinder part of the boat, the back of the boat. While the disciples were full of panic, Jesus was sleeping on a pillow. The Bible says, on a pillow. You know what this shows me? That he had peace in the storm. See, Philippians 4, verse 7 says, And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So when you're facing a storm in life and you run to Jesus, you can find peace in the middle of that storm, whatever it is. Amen. Peace that other people will scratch your head and go, I don't know how you can have peace during, during what the doctors told you. I don't know how you can have peace with your children living out of sin. I don't know how you can have peace with this. And yet God can give you peace. And you can live in peace in the midst of a storm. Yes. Take your Bible to the book of Psalm. Psalm. We find him sleeping in a storm. Psalm chapter number 46. This shows me that we can have rest in the storm. Rest in the storm. Psalm chapter number 46. A short, a short psalm. A lot of them are. Psalm 46. Starting at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help and trouble. Therefore, Will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea? Is that a pretty big storm? Amen. <laughs> I'd say so. Though the waters are of roar, and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, say Lord. There is a river, the stream whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High God. Is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. Jesus was in the boat. Here the Psalms are saying, The Lord is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Say, Oh, come. Behold the works of the Lord, what desolations He hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. Because He can bring peace. He breaketh the bow and cut the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Say law. By the way, Rick asked me last night at the meeting or at, at, uh, at his house if I knew the word said. He knew what it meant, but he asked me if I knew what it meant because I was a, uh, I was a music major in college. It's a musical term. It means to pause, to think, to ponder, to meditate on that. And a lot of times they'd come to this word say law in the book of Psalms. They'd actually pause and they'd repeat it one time. Amen. And you find that written three different times in this one passage. So stop and think about the greatness of God. Yes, amen. Though your world around you begins to crumble, though the ship that you're living in begins to be full of water, begin, begins to become full of trials and troubles and turmoil, stop and think about how great God is. And if you're a Christian, He is with you in the boat. Yes, amen. Where is He? Where is Jesus? Where is He? I can't find Him. That's because you're too busy in the front of the boat trying to get all the water out instead of going back to the boat where Jesus is and finding rest and peace in the midst of the storm. We find that you can have rest in the storm. Jesus was asleep because He knew who was in charge. He knew who was in charge. A lot of times we think we can handle something. We can't. We have to admit who's in charge. It's not us. 
And it's not the situation we're facing. Jesus knew who was in charge. See, this is what I was saying earlier. In the inner part of the boat where Jesus was sleeping is where the controls were for the boat. All the controlling oars, the, the, the direction of the oars, the underneath where he was sleeping is the, where they keep all of their controls for the boat with the ropes and the anchors and all the different things they use. And they were found back there where Jesus was sleeping, right by where Jesus was. See, Jesus was by the controls. Jesus was in control the whole time. When you're by the controls, nobody can get there to the controls unless they go through you first. See, Jesus was in control. Not only was Jesus in control, but He's on top of everything the whole time. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm not catching it. Think about it for just a second. He was there when the boat is controlled and he was in control of the boat and in control of the situation the entire time. Amen. <laughs> he was in control. He knew he was in control. Not only that, the storm he was in control. Let's take a quick look at the results of the storm and we're done. A couple results from the storm of having to face this trial and having to go through this storm so many times. We ask God to just stop the storm. And sometimes He will, like He did for the disciples. But sometimes He'll just tell you what He told Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. Yes. Amen. Sometimes that's what He'll tell you. Because He knows what's needed. But the result of the storm, either way. When you take a look at these three passages, you put them side to side, you find that there's a transference of fear. A transference of fear. When they first... When the, storm first arose, what were they afraid of? The storm. They were afraid of their situation. They were afraid that they couldn't handle it. They were afraid of all the physical things that was going on around them. All the emotional experiences that they were dealing with. That's what they feared. Oh, but at the end of the story, their fear goes from being that of the physical and what's around them. We find one of our passages where it says they feared him. The transference of fear is from the fear of the world to the fear of God. To the fear of God. By the way, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not, able, are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You say, who should I fear? You should fear God before you fear the world. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't know if I'm a Christian. I know I'm not a Christian. If I get saved, they might make fun of me. I might get mocked. <clears throat> but if you refuse, and you fear the world more than you fear God, then one day you will stand before God and He will judge you. I would rather be mocked by man on this world Amen. for a few years Amen. Then to stand before God and be cast like a cloud forever. That's right. Because I was more afraid of man than I was of God. Right. You say, but I thought God was loving and kind. He is. He's gracious. He's loving. He's kind. He's merciful. Oh, but there comes a time when He's just. He's righteous. He's holy. Yeah. And there comes a time when you will stand before Him and you must fear God. Every atheist today who, re who refuses to fear God one day will fear Him. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They will fear. Every person in the world will fear God. The question is, will you fear Him in this life or will you fear Him when it's too late? Will you fear Him as a father? I think, there's, I think it's okay for a child to fear them. I still have a little bit of fear for my father. They're, they're growing up, I would, there was a few. My, my dad was not afraid to take the paddle to me. He wasn't afraid of it. My mom wasn't either for that matter. I got a lot of spankings growing up. But anyway, <laughs> they weren't afraid to use it. And I had a fear of mom. I had a fear of dad. Oh, but I knew they loved me. Amen. But when I did something wrong, you know what there was in my heart? Fear. You say, well, when should we fear God? Well, when you're living in sin. Amen. You should fear God. 
When you're in right fellowship with God, there's no reason to fear Him. Right. Oh, but when you are in sin, you better fear God. Yes. If you are in a lifestyle of sin, you better fear God. If you are lost and you're watching by internet or however you're viewing this or hearing this and you're lost, you better fear God. Yes. Right. Right. Amen. There needs to be the transference of fear just like the disciples went through. They feared the world, the storm, the boat, the situation. But at the end, they feared God. Right. Number two, there's a transference of faith. A transference of faith. See, the transference of faith took place from their own abilities to God's supernatural power. Beginning the storm, they tried their own abilities. Oh, we're fishing. We can deal with this. Come on, Peter. Let's get this thing going. Yeah, come on. We're going to get this. We know how to, we can handle it. And then it gets out of their control. Oh, this is above our abilities. And they turn to Christ and they find that He had the answer all along. If only we'd stop trying to face all of our battles and our own abilities first. And run to Christ first. Instead of our own abilities. We find He already has a solution. He already has a power. To handle whatever we're facing. He, already deal, he can already help you deal with whatever it is you're dealing with. But you got to transfer your faith from your own abilities. Lay that at the altar. Say God is not mine. It's yours. I can't deal with it. I can't handle it. I can't bear it. But God, with your supernatural power, not only can I deal with it, but God, you might be gracious enough to even take it away. Because you're able to. Jesus said, all power is given unto me, both in heaven and on earth. He has all power. And without Christ, we have no power. Right. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, where it says, For by grace we are saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, and we get to God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not in abilities, it's not in works, but it's by the grace of God. Amen. Christians, sometimes we get into a situation <clears throat> and our faith becomes shaken. It becomes shaken in, in our Christian faith and who God is in church. And you say, what do I do? You run to Jesus. And you say like the man at the bottom of the mountain, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Lord, I believe. I know I believe, but Lord, I need your strength right now. I need you. This situation I am in is shattering my faith. And instead of faith, I'm having fear. Right. And God, I believe you can do it. Yes. But would you help my unbelief, the parts right. of me that still doubt? Yes. Right. We need to transfer our fear, our faith. Finally, there's a transference of what I call the wow factor. You say, where do you get that? I get that, uh, that word wow factor from... A while back ago, the kids and I, we were watching a thing called Monster Jam. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or not. It's these big trucks, you know, and they're, you know, maximum destruct. All these, they run all these cars, and they do these flips, and they get points for all these different things. And they're always talking about the wow factor. That's the, that is the biggest move. That is the greatest flip. That's a wow! Everybody's going, wow! You know, and they're all excited. That's the wow factor. And we find one of the accounts that you have the wow factor. That is... The Bible says in one of the accounts we read that they marveled. Yes. Right. That means when, when, they, when Jesus got done saying, Peace be still, and stop going, What? Wow. Yep. That's the greatest thing I've ever seen. It was a wow factor. You say, What do you mean? There, see, there is a transference of the wow factor. That is, from the power of the storm to the power of God. See, when they first went into the storm and they were in the middle of the storm, wow, we can't deal with it. Wow, this is more than we can bear. But then they realized that Jesus was even more powerful than that storm. And their wow factor went from the storm to how powerful God is. Yep. Let me ask you, when was the last time you had a wow factor with God? Amen. When was the last time?
time that you went, wow, God, you're great. Yes. Right. See, they realized that not only was Jesus in control the entire time, but that he was in command the entire time. Yeah. The Bible says that he commanded the winds and the sea to be still. Not only could he control it, but he was in command of it. Right. Psalm 33, 8, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. When was the last time, child of God, that you just went before God and you said, Lord, my storm is great, but wow, you're so much greater. Thank you, Jim. Amen. My situation is troubling, and it's it's great, and I have this wow factor. I'm like, wow, what I can't deal with it, but Lord, wow, I stand in awe of your great mercy, of your grace, your compassion, your strength. When was the last time you got alone with God and just had a wow moment with God? Have you ever had one? We ought to be having those almost on a daily basis. We have our devotions. Yeah. Wow. You're so gracious. What storm are you facing today? What are you having to deal with this morning? That's got your faith shattered. It's got your faith shaken. That you're looking at and going, wow, Lord, this is more than I can bear. I want to encourage you today to come and to transfer your fear. Lost one, transfer your fear from the world to the fear of God and say, Lord, I need you. Transfer your faith from your own abilities to the supernatural power of God. And transfer your wow factor, whatever trouble you're facing, to the wow factor of how great God is. Yes. The song talks about turning your eyes upon Jesus. Yes. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim. Why? 